missed our high school yearbook. <laughs> and we fittingly were on the same page. <laughs>
Catholic school of edu education was both my salvation and my damnation. It was my salvation because the education I got was a very good education. It was my damnation because once you get those nuns in your head, you never get them out of your head. But we had a similar experience uh, in that way, and our paths met at what was then uh, one of the better high schools, the best high schools uh, in New York City, and that was Carl Spelman High School in the Northeast Bronx, which was a, a bit of a trek for each of us, right? Significant, until my mom moved to Carl City. Okay, that's right, that's right, yes. Uh, so, uh, we had that in common. Uh, so, uh, I wanted to ask you about a couple of things, though, and, and uh, can you talk a little bit, I know you talk about it in your book, but can you talk a little bit more about what it meant to grow up in public housing at that time and what your experiences you know, were? Uh, I had two sets of friends, the people I grew up with and the people I went to school with. They, there was not much overlap. It wasn't. It was very much two different worlds. Um, first of all, living in the projects, there was only a small handful of kids who lived in the projects who went to Catholic school. Your parents, at least one of your parents, had to be convinced that it was worth the sacrifice. And for, I think, each of our parents, it was a huge, huge sacrifice. And I know your dad um, wasn't around for a lot of your life, and neither was mine, because mine had died. And you might want to, I won't share your high school diploma story with that, but, um, is it all right if I tell <laughs> Teddy and I were at dinner and he was telling me that he went back to Spelman for an event and he was telling the story there that he had never really received his high school diploma. Um, they told him he could go to the ceremony and he got an empty case, but they explained that his dad had fallen behind in paying the tuition and he wouldn't get his diploma until that tuition was paid. That day, one of the teachers, uh, after he finished the program, came back with a diploma, and he opened it, and it was orig his original diploma, which had sat in Spelman's vault for about years. years. For about <laughs> but that story, I think, you know, um, my brother who was in Spelman with me a few years back, um, was ridiculed in front of the basketball team because he had ratty sneakers. Um, and he came home crying, and my mother was absolutely chagrined. Um, she couldn't afford new sneakers at that point. That's a world that I don't think many of our classmates knew about. Handful. Yeah. You know, I. Uh, but I think in that time, I don't know about you, but I hid it. You hid it? Mm hmm. I didn't talk about it. Um, uh, yeah, although there were a cadre of people we went to school with who came from either public housing or tenements in the South Bronx. Well, yeah, I don't know, but those kids, yes. But did you bring any of those kids who lived in. Um, oh, no, in, two different worlds. Right. Yeah. You never two brought them home. And, and, and most of the uh, most of the people I grew up with uh, in the projects, in which in Castle Hill projects, or many, I should say, um, they. You know, I think about Jonathan Kozol's book. Some of you may remember the title, "Death at an Early Age." Many of them, literally, physical death, but uh, if not that, uh, kind of intellectual death, um, uh, and. I'm always self-conscious, I'm interested in, in whether you think about this. I'm self-conscious about talking about these things sometimes, one might not think so, in mixed company to the extent that sometimes people um, patronize when they hear this. And I don't want patronization. You know, I'm not interested in that. Uh, it was just the reality, and what I want is folks to understand how differently people live. Uh, you know, how people have options that you know, some people don't have. So my belief, I remember a conversation when I was at the University of Michigan on the faculty with one of my colleagues 
who had written a lot about affirmative action. I don't want to get into substantive issues. I can say this, but the justice can't get into these issues. Uh, but we were talking on the way home one day. We were walking together. And I told him, I believe that there are thousands or tens of thousands, if not more, of uh, people who were uh, just as capable in terms of their intellectual abilities, if they were developed, to do the kinds of things that we would do. And he simply, he turned to me and he said, I simply don't believe that. I never forgot that. You know, it's a question of how you see the world. My editor, who I adore, a marvelous, marvelous editor. I have a great relationship with him. I have a line in my book that basically said, it's a pity that um, there's been some improvements, but there's still a lot of schools out there that don't teach poor kids well. And he changed the line. And he kept saying, times have changed. Schools are teaching kids better. We fought and fought because he insisted that the world I was describing didn't exist today. We finally compromised with, I would hope, <laughs> lawyers compromise, right? <laughs> but it's, it's not back then, it's now. Yeah. Yeah. We live in, in places where people don't, because they haven't experienced it, and, and I believe wonder, that it exists. And I wonder, with all due respect, what he was invested in that compelled him to, to fight that battle on that issue. It's an interesting question. I, I've not asked him that, but um, I regrettably still have many friends in that other world of mine, which is quite below to me, and know that that reality is still true. Well, I want to say that, uh, you know, as I read through your book, the places you talked about, you know, Kelly Street, Southern Boulevard, you know, for, for folks who grew up in the Bronx, you know, the, there was a certain residence, um, and it really meant a lot for me to read through all that, and I know a lot of this is going to go over the heads of most of the audience here. Uh, you know, I, in this journey, new journey of mine, I think I've met every Bronxite who ever stepped before. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, and, and there's one other thing I want to, uh, to say, and I don't, I, I don't want you to comment on this for obvious reasons. There was a case that was in the Supreme Court. Well, for a minute. There was a case that was in the Supreme Court a few years ago that, that raised the question of whether uh, evictions from public housing because of a family member who used drugs, whether that was constitutional. You know, you had the phenomenon of uh, you know, some grandmother who had a grandchild living with her, uh, you know, and the child gets busted with weed, and then the grandmother gets kicked out. Um, that case uh, upheld those evictions. Uh, nobody on the Supreme Court up until that time, and after, until you, uh, work in public housing, whatever you think about the merits someone who has that experience brings another perspective. Uh, and, you know, the question I ask is, if you think about the rationale, usually it's that you're living on public supported housing uh, and public policy, and, you know, we could talk about drug policy, etc. But, uh, you know, I now live in a privately owned house. The bank really owns it, but I mean... <laughs> Uh, and it is subsidized indirectly through my tax deduction uh, that I get. Uh, and we all as homeowners get. That may change. But the point is this. If uh, somebody in our family gets caught with weed, we don't get kicked out of our houses. Uh, so I just wanted to talk about and mention, you know, the, the value of people from different experiences, which of course was an issue that came up during the nomination. Um, could, could you talk a little bit though about when you 
decided that, uh, or saw it as possible, I know when it is because I've read it and we talked about it, but uh, where did this idea of being a judge come from? You know, you were at the top of our class. I was somewhere else. <laughs> uh, not bad, but not at the top of the class. Um, when did this come to you? Now, in a really childlike way, it was from Perry Mason. And um, it was a moment in the show where Perry Mason turned to the judge after another witness broke down and admitted to him. I did it, I did it, I had to do it. And I gotta tell you something, I've been a judge now in 22 years and I've never seen a transcript where that <laughs> At any rate, you know, it's not going to occur, guys. Uh, I remember Perry turning to the judge, who throughout the show would sustain or overrule objections, and I didn't pay that much attention to the judge. But in that moment, Perry turned to the judge and said, Your Honor, I move to dismiss the charges against my client and release him from bail. And I had sort of my own personal epiphany, which was, you know, Perry did all the work, but the guy who made the final decision was that judge. And I thought to myself, I want to be that guy. <laughs> uh, so that, that's a good thing. I want to be Perry Mason. She wanted to be the judge. <laughs> And then I think you're right. I, I you know, I, I, as I grew older, this was about 10 years old, as I grew older and I got to high school, and as you may know, I got involved in the debate club and forensics because I was training to be a lawyer and student government and all that other stuff that I do. Um, I had a growing sense of the importance of law in human relations that what law was, was a way of our society dealing with each other. All these competing interests that we have as a society have to be regulated in some form. Now, we have other parameters that help regulate human relationships. Religion does, morality does, family, um, community in, in smaller and larger senses. But the law gives a framework. And I, watching the civil rights movement, um, and we were really at the, at, at the tail end of it, but I watched it, and I watched it with admiration and with a great deal of hope about what the law meant for America and how important it was in ensuring, you know, I, I actually believe in the, our equality and the rule of law, and the sense of its fairness and about justice. In many ways, I'm pretty naive even to this day. I believe it. And I guess I sense I'm in an audience where all of you wouldn't be doing everything you're doing unless you believed it too. And so, for me, um, that, that it was that growing sense that I wanted to be a part of. Well, you know, I, uh, uh, you talk about the Civil Rights Movement, mm -hmm. and that was the backdrop of our youth, uh, and then the other movements that came out of the Civil Rights Movement. And it wasn't so much that I decided I wanted to be a lawyer, at some point I did. Uh, you know, yes, Perry Mason, uh, Anakin Finch, you know, those stories, those characters. Uh, but I wanted to be part of this movement uh, that was changing lives and the lives of the people in the communities from which I came and people like them. So I had decided that uh, I wanted to do civil rights work and I thought law was the best way to do it. Uh, but I wanted to go back to something else too. Uh, we, we took a different path. Well, we did, we did, which is why when, you, when, when again, some folks uh, uh, confused what your career had been. I mean, I said to myself, for goodness sake, she was a prosecutor. 
You know, she wasn't a civil rights lawyer. I mean, she was engaged with the, for example, on the board of uh, Puerto Rican Legal Defense Fund, etc. Uh, but it was a different path. No it was a path. very different path, but I didn't see them as conflicting. Perhaps you no. saw them that way more. No, I, well, maybe in, in my earlier years. <laughs> <laughs> I did in my earlier years, you know, and, and maybe as a law student. I bet that there's a whole big group of lawyers out of that audience who make a lot of money in traditional commercial pursuits. And they're here. That's right. All right? And so for me, yes, I took a different path because my, not that my interests were different. I mean, I sat on the Puerto Rican Legal Defense and Education Board right. literally within six months of my graduating from law school. So our interests were different. Um, but I think even then, I wanted to be a part of the policy of it, of sort of not making the policy or the litigation, but the direction that the civil, that, that organization was going to take on behalf of my community then. And that seemed the role that made more sense to me. Well, I felt a, a certain, I'm not sure if this, uh, I can articulate this well, a certain kind of protectiveness for you when you were nominated, uh, for, for, for when people attacked you uh, and tried to portray you in a certain way. And I felt like saying, no, 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 no. I did that kind of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, and you can attack me uh, because I know I'm not going to be nominated or confirmable for dog catching. <laughs> <laughs> but I think that, um, uh, you know, it all worked out uh, in the event. Well, no, it did. And, and I, you know, no, I wasn't you. I didn't do the kind of civil rights advocacy that you did. No, but, I, but I knew where you were. Yeah, no, no, yeah. no. Yeah, you did because I did sort of institutional That's work right. rather than line work. Um, but the, I don't see the goals as mutually exclusive. Mm -hmm. And I think each part of it has to work together. Um, and it doesn't work unless people are involved on different levels of change and improvement. If I can shift for a minute, I've seen something that I wish everybody in this audience could see. Even though I've known you for all these years, I've watched you now as you interacted with, um, with younger people, and particularly young people in uh, the Bronx and in the South Bronx, and I've seen you speak to them, talk to them, and I've seen you reflected through their eyes. And it is an extraordinary thing to see. Would you talk about your relationship with these young folks and what you try to impart to them? When I see those kids sitting in the audiences that I tend to visit, and by the way, it's not always inner city schools, but it's often inner city schools, um, and even some Catholic schools, because I go back to some of them. They are faces like those I grew up with. They are kids that I see myself in. And what I try to do as I'm looking at them, I try to sit where they're sitting and look at myself through their eyes. And I find that when I do that, I can remember how I felt when I was their age. And I try to remember what was important to them then. Because we all assume that when we speak to kids, that they're looking for us to impart wisdom on everything. The reality is it's, that's not true. <laughs> we grow into stages in which some things make sense to us and others don't. And I try with each group of kids to have a sense of what's important to them. What is it that they have fears about, concerns about, anxieties about, and to talk to them openly about that. Because I know, growing up in the world that I did, how strange everything seemed at every single moment. You know, I, I don't know. 
um, when you first went to SWAC, an apartment outside the projects? Uh, you know, uh, you, you asked that, oh, oh, you raised that question, and uh, there's some things that only people who grew up in public housing say. Uh, so oh, we would. Projects are public housing. <laughs> well, they are, but, but, but what I was thinking about was we used to refer to people who didn't live in the projects as living in the private houses. Right. And, and mm -hmm. we thought that everybody who lived in those houses, they were wealthy. Obviously, but it wasn't true. Right. I mean, that's yeah. what we thought. Yeah. You know, it took my getting out of our, my public housing to go visit a, a young friend of mine. Mm -hmm. This was like fifth or sixth grade. Her parents removed her from our Blessed Sacrament neighborhood to a more ritzy private area further north in the Bronx. And she invited me to visit one weekend and wanted me to ride bikes with her. And you couldn't ride a bike in the projects. And so her father taught me how to ride a bike. And you really don't forget how to ride a bike once you do it. <laughs> and, and, and to be clear, when you say you couldn't ride a bike in the projects, it's not that nobody did. did oh, no, but I was a little bit too. Right. I mean, what would happen is that some bigger kid would come along and say, Steal it. let me hold your bike for you. <laughs> and that would be the last time. You my did. book describes my poor brother got beat up all the time. <laughs> um, and everything he owned was stolen from him. Um, and I defended, I did a lot of his fights for him. But <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't be with him all the time. <laughs> so, um, can you talk about finding your way, as you did in the book, but share with this audience, not everybody, but finding your way from Cardinal Spellman to Princeton. As I said, you graduated, our class, by the way, at the time was about 90% white, right? That's Barbara. As I said, one of the better high schools in the city, and Sonia was at the top of our class. Um, there was one other fellow, you were neck and neck. Well, he was on the boys' side, so. That's right, that's right, because the, the, the more than you need to know, but the yeah. school was uh, at first segregated by gender. Yes, uh, we had a boys' side and a girls' side. That's right. And we met and watched That's right. Um, and in religion class. <laughs> Ironically. Yes. <laughs> and uh, uh, so if you could talk about finding your way um, to Princeton. Well, you tell them how you found yourself to Wesleyan, because I didn't even know about the sister schools when I was at Stone. But I didn't know what the Ivy League schools were. Um, I was just lucky enough that one of the male teachers had guided my one of my then best friends and still very close friend, Kenny Moore. You remember Kenny? Oh, yeah. I know. Um, he had his sister Janet. Kenny and Janet. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, <laughs> Kenny, who was the coach of the girl side mm -hmm. forensics club, uh, because the girl side wouldn't provide us with a formal coach. Um, the guys got a formal coach, but Ken came and did it for us. He was only two years older than we were, so um, Title IX wasn't passed yet. <laughs> um, at any rate, that, Ken, that was a pointed observation. Yeah, I mean, I mean you know, it's, it's a bit of a different world. Um, at any rate, Kenny called me up from Princeton, where his math teacher had guided him and said, you have to apply to the Ivy League schools. And those of you who read my book know the story. And I said, what's that? And he said, the best college you can go to. I said, can't afford it. And he said, um, they'll give you a scholarship. I said, I can't even afford the applications. And new colleges cost money to apply. And he said, they'll wait. You've got to go. It's the best education you can receive. The next question is, so where are they? <laughs> and he mentioned Princeton, Yale, Columbia, Stanford, and I said, okay. I eliminated Columbia because it was in New York and I wanted to go away from home. And I went, and Yale, and I went to visit the other three schools. Now you have to read my book to hear the story. <laughs> but I had um, an experience with radicals at Yale and decided, this little good Catholic girl wasn't going to that radical school. <laughs> I went to Harvard and met a lady, um, and a more senior lady, 
beautifully cockered gray hair, a black dress with what I understood to be real pearls, <coughs> an Asian rug, two white chairs without plastic covering. <laughs> That didn't exist in my neighborhood. <laughs> and I looked at this vision and thought to myself, where am I? I've just landed on another planet. And all of a sudden, yapping at my feet are these black and white poodles. <laughs> and she sat down on the couch. This is a rat, a, a, a rat quit. And she sat down on the couch, and the two dogs went by her side. And I was dumbstruck. Absolutely dumbstruck. That was the shortest interview I've ever had in any <laughs> I don't think I lasted 10 or 15 minutes. I couldn't talk to this lady. And I fled. It's the first and the only time that I fled. I went outside to the receptionist, told her to tell the students who were going to show me the campus that I had to leave. And I retraced my steps right back onto the train and went home. And you end up at Princeton, because not exactly I, the lump and crawl attack. No. <laughs> I had a friend, he was a hippie, he had grown, it in like six months, he had grown his hair down to his waist. Uh -huh. Now he's turning, he's a little older than I am, next week, and he's growing his hair back. Uh -huh. I think he's going backwards in life, but at any rate, um, uh, Kenny was a, you know, a hippie, and, and the people I met through him were very laid back, and they made me feel very welcomed, and so I said, I'll go to that place, it doesn't look too bad. So, one of the things that I think about a lot these days, uh, and, you know, as comfortable as you can be in making an observation, because frankly, these issues, a lot of these issues aren't uh, legally cognizable right now. Um, so I think about uh, class mobility, mm -hmm. you know, the experiences that we had. We could say a lot more about how those opportunities came to us, but, and you've talked about it in your book. But America, and I'm not only talking about for people of color, I'm talking about in general, uh, we're losing class mobility. I'm so conscious of that uh, across the board. Uh, and I think some of well, the answers. Well, that for us. Yeah. Um, you know, with with the rising cost of, of education, there's a lot more of kids, and I'm not talking just of kids of our background. I'm talking about kids across the spectrum who no longer have the hope of attending the schools we do, and so that's certainly affecting mobility. Yes. And the fact that you went to Columbia and I went to Yale has a lot to do with the possibilities that we have in our employment opportunities. Yeah. And I think that's changing dramatically. But you're right. It's not the same. Yeah. Uh, and I believe that's one of the, if not the, uh, most challenging issues of the 21st century. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, and for the country, yeah. because as the wealth difference grows, we're going to, I suspect, have many of the problems that many other countries have, and the unrest that many of the other countries have. So, I've asked you from time to time a question that really is, uh, it doesn't capture what I'm trying to get at. Uh, I've asked you the question about how you have fun, but that's the wrong word. That's, that's the wrong description. You know, uh, you come to what you do with a great deal of sobriety. Uh, it, it's challenging, but maybe can you talk about um, uh, how you feel about the work you do? How you negotiate this? Uh, this great weight that's on you? Is it a uh, you have a passion for it and a love for it, uh, but um, uh, what's, what's it like? <laughs> um, it was tough, much, much tougher at the very beginning. Um, being wrestled from a job I loved in a city that I grew up in and adore, 
And for my life, I was perfectly consenting. Um, and thrown into Washington, D.C. was um, like somebody throwing cold water on me. Um, it was tough. The transition for me into this new world that becomes the life of the Supreme Court Justice is not easy. The public attention on every word you say, the, um, the sort of uh, public deference that you're paying. Uh, you know, it, it's sort of strange to say that people stop treating you like a person. Uh, and, and that becomes very hard for somebody like me who really likes people and wants to have living room conversations that are not reported on Twitter, um, that are not reported on Facebook, that are not um, sent out to the world. Um, one of my second summers home, I'm outside my apartment walking to a store, talking to a friend who had come to help me with a barbecue about how to cook whatever we were planning to cook. And on the internet the next day, uh, Justice Sotomayor is seen walking with a friend arguing <laughs> about how to cook chicken. <laughs> Why do you care? <laughs> Why does anybody care? Uh, but it is the price of doing this in life. It's one of the reasons I actually started to write my book. Because I needed a way to escape from this public fishbowl and this massive change that had occurred to me. And the book became a way, really, for almost three summers, of stepping back from this world and back into the world I had just left. And holding on to my memories and holding on to um, the things that, the values and the people and the places that have been important to me. I didn't want to lose them. And so it was a way of memorializing them in the book and sort of detaching me from the great weight that I felt on myself. It is hard to make the decisions we make. People think that um, the questions are easy for them if you believe that the answer is clear to your preference of what's right. But the reality is that, to me, as a justice, it's not what's right, it's what I think the law requires. You know, the other day I was asked um, how come I could, can't separate myself from my, um, in my recent descent that you know about, from my life experiences. And I said to the person questioning me, it's easy when precedent supports you. <laughs> You know, I mean, uh, what I said is if people read it, they would understand that I wasn't living my life experiences. I was doing what I understood was the law. Well, with all due respect, I have another observation, which is that there is an assumption that the other justices have separated themselves from their experiences. <laughs> And I question that assumption. <laughs> well, that's what you say. I'm not asking you to comment on that. That's one of the observations about that. Well, but you know, the reality is that I don't think there's many human beings who can set, who know when their experiences are influencing them. Well, I think that's right. I think that's right. Now, you know, but, but I think justices and judges ought to strive to rise above their own experiences, or at least to recognize them when they're in play. Um, well, I, I'm going to give you a prime example, because it is unconscious of it. And I can do it because it, was pub it pu happens publicly. Um, in a recent uh, case that, that everybody here will probably know about, one of my colleagues asked, who owns two cell phones? Why would anybody? <laughs> All right? Um, now, in a room full of government lawyers, <laughs> each one of them who has two cell phones? <laughs> but 
But my point is that that issue was remedied very quickly, okay? Um, and that misimpression was. But that's the kind of exa simple example, really not controversial, about how our own life experiences can influence you without you even knowing and not recognizing. And you're right, we should rise above it. But in sort of a, uh, my own pandering to the importance of diversity, and I don't, off, I don't mean just ethnic, and gender diversity, I mean life experience diversity. Um, that's why it's important to have people with different life experiences, not just based on that two criteria, but their backgrounds in law, their backgrounds in career, their backgrounds in everything, on the bench, and especially on the court, like the Supreme Court, because we have to sort of correct each other from misimpressions. We are. Uh, pretty much out of time. One other, one other question I'd like you to speak to. Uh, there are a lot of law students in this room and young lawyers. Uh, I don't know how many of them harbor ambitions with respect to being on the bench, uh, even perhaps on the Supreme Court. Um, and there's the issue of playing it safe. Um, not standing for anything controversial, etc. Uh, what would you tell these young folks? What Judge Nancy Burke says in her book. Nancy, where are you? Here. All right. Um, and I just had the privilege recently to start her book. I haven't finished it completely, but I'm almost there. Um, and she has had a civil rights background that Probably Ted. I hear you. Oh, she wouldn't be less than a dog catcher. <laughs> Nancy, is that true? And she, uh, she became a federal judge. You, I think that the answer to everything is in life is to remain true to yourself. First of all, you have to hope that you've developed values that of integrity, of honesty, of willingness to give and not take, that I think are important in life generally, not just to lawyers, but to people. So long as you keep those values in mind as you practice, and you sense that you practice in ways in which you see the profession the way I do, which is a profession of giving, of serving, of helping, that if you keep that in the forefront, then it doesn't really matter, does it, whether you get to the Supreme Court or not? Because hopefully you'll be choosing work that you like, and you'll like yourself in doing it. And I really do think that's much more important. And if you do it, and you do it well, because that's the prerequisite to, I think, any success in life, you have to hope the way Nancy and I do, that you'll be noticed someday, and you'll have this opportunity of being struck by lightning. Um, and it is being struck by lightning, and I was fortunate. Well, the nation is fortunate. I am so proud.